church. He arose, rebuked the wind, said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Notice in verse 37 that as they got on board the ship, that there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into their ship, so that it was now full. Tonight I want to preach to you on this subject, an unexpected storm. An unexpected storm. Let's pray together. I share this with you. Father, would you guide, lead, and direct us? Thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for this church, this pastor, these people. I pray your hand of blessing will rest here. And I pray you help them to go forward like they've never gone forward before. And I pray that you deal with us thoroughly tonight. Help somebody, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, it's vitally important that you understand from the outset of this message that these disciples in this story were simply doing the will of God. They were getting on board this ship because He told them to get on board this ship. But understand that even as they followed Him in obedience, this storm came. And it's interesting to know here that sometimes these storms can come unexpectedly. I mean, I say this to you, you need to understand this, that following Christ will not prevent the storms of life. It's just, that's living in a fairy tale land. What I'm saying is, is this life is full of storms. Now, thank God if you know the Lord, we're going to a, to a shore where there's not, you know, there's not going to be any more storms. You understand that. But while we travel through this life, our boat, this boat is a picture of your life. Every now and then the sea is calm, thank God for those times, but every now and then the seas are roaring against us and the waves are beating up against us. Now what I want to do tonight is I want to tie myself down to this passage because no doubt, even though the Lord is on board this ship, this, this storm was not unexpected to Him, but it was unexpected to the disciples. They didn't understand about this. They didn't know this. They, they didn't expect this storm to hit them. And this being the case, I just want to walk through this passage. It's very simple tonight. But if you'll let it speak to you, it'll help you. May I say this to you? If you don't need this tonight, you ought to get on your face and thank God for it. But you will need it if you live long enough. Several things as we travel through this passage, thinking about an unexpected storm. Number one, I want to show you the storm. This is found in verse number 37. If you'll read verse number 37 with me, it says, And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. Now there's two things about this storm that comes out in this verse. Number one, it was a big storm. The Bible calls it a great wind. That word great means uh, uh, big in size and strength. You know what I've noticed? I've noticed that my trouble may not seem big to you, but it's humongous to me. And may I say this to you, when you're going through troubles, other people may not realize how big it is, but every storm that hits us, especially an unexpected storm like this one, it can be a big storm. It was not only big, number two, it was a beating storm. The Bible teaches us here in this verse, it says, and the waves beat into the ship. They beat into the ship. In other words, this word means that, that, that this storm was taking its toll on the ship. These waves were pounding up against this boat. Understand the storm was big and beating. Number two, we notice the ship itself. This is found in verse 37 as well. Two things about the ship. The storm is big and beating, right? It's huge and it's beating up against them. Now let's look at the ship itself. The ship, two things about it. First of all, it's full. Say, what do you mean? Notice the last part of verse number 37, so that it was now... Full. You know what that means? It means it can't take anymore. You ever been there? You ever been there? I can't take anymore of this, Lord. Where are you, God? Maybe this is how you feel tonight. The ship was full. But when I say this to you, the, the parallel account, don't turn to it, stay here in Mark, but the parallel account is found in Matthew chapter 8. And in Matthew chapter 8, if you would read that parallel account, you'll find a second thing about this ship. It was not only full, it was flooding. You say, what do you mean? The Bible says in Matthew 8 that the waves covered the ship. You know what that word covered means? It means to engulf or hide. 
You know what that tells me? If you had looked down on that storm, you couldn't see the ship. But put yourself on board the ship. It's full, but the water keeps coming. It just keeps on pounding. And this word engulf carries the idea that everywhere they looked, even when they looked up, all they saw was water. And all they saw was the storm beating upon them. Number one, we see the storm. It's big and it's beating. We see the ship. It's full. It can't take it anymore, but the water just keeps coming anyway to the point that everywhere they look, that's the only thing they can see. Then the third thing we notice here is we notice the sailors, or can I say the disciples. If you're saved tonight, they are a picture of you and I. Can I give you two things about them? Number one, they're scared. We see this in verse number 40. Notice it in verse number 40. We know they're scared because of what the Lord asked them. He says in verse 40, why are you so what? Why are you so fearful? Why are you afraid? I'll tell you why they were afraid, because they thought they weren't going to make it. They thought they were going to die. Get this, fear had taken the place of faith. Boy, I've been there. I'm talking about instead of believing what God says, you start looking at your storm and you start realizing the circumstances make sense about this. I'm not going to make it through this. That's what's going on here. This is the mighty disciples we're talking about. This is those that the Lord is going to use to turn the world right side up. These are people who, and at this time, while their ship is is full and flooding because the storm is big and beating up against them, they're scared. Second thing about them, they're skeptical. You say, what do you mean? They're doubting. You say, how do you know this? Look at verse number 38. And he was in the hinder part of the ship asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Can I ask you a question? Don't you think they already knew the answer to this question? But it's interesting that at this time, with him on board the ship, they were doubting his love. They were doubting his concern and his care. Now these disciples had witnessed repeated proofs of his love for them. They had witnessed repeated proofs of his care and concern for them. But all of that was forgotten in this present danger that they were in. Can I say this to you here? It is possible to forsake all for Christ and yet be occasionally overtaken by doubt and fear. It is. It's possible to do that. We see it here with these disciples. Let me go back and tap this on the head. I'm just, I'm just laying groundwork. Here we go. Now I'm three quarters of the, I'm talking about through, but my fourth point is probably the longest point. Okay, so stay with me here. We've seen the storm. It, it, and by the way, it's an unexpected storm. But even if it's not unexpected, it's, it, any storm of life, it's a big storm. It's a beating storm. It's beating up against you. The waves are crashing on you to the point that your ship is full You can't take it anymore, but it doesn't stop. It just keeps on coming to the point that everywhere you look, even when you look Godward, that you can still see the storm because you're engulfed in it. And it's got you to the point that you're scared and you're skeptical. By the way, if you've never been scared or skeptical, I want you to get in line tonight. I want you to sign my Bible, okay? Because you're a whole lot better Christian than me. What am I saying to you is God gets real with us in this passage. He's showing us that it's kind of a normal thing even for people who are sold out to Jesus Christ. It's natural to get afraid. It's natural to start doubting God. That doesn't make it right, but it's natural. Now that's where we come to really the meat of the message. And that is with all that going on, with the sailors scared and skeptical because their boat is full and flooding because of the big and beating storm, we come to the fourth thing, and that is we see the Savior. So let me slow down if I can. I may not be able to do that, but let me try to slow down. And while there are two things about the ship and two things about the storm and two things about the sailors, there's four things about the Savior. There's four things that I want to encourage you with because this is something I've lived literally through this. 
I've been to this point where I've been in that dark hole where I thought there's no escape. I've been in that dark hole where I thought God himself had turned his back on me to the point that I began to have suicidal thoughts in my mind. I never tried anything, but I sure contemplated it. I told my wife, take my blood pressure pills from me. I don't trust myself. I was thinking about just swallowing all of them. Found out later, and I never went looking for it, but I found that she took our guns in our house and hid them from me. I know what it's I was a preacher. I was pastoring my home church at this time. I know what it's like. I know what it's like when your boat is full and flooding. And it seems like, where is God? Why aren't you helping? I, I know what that's like. And that's what's ha- taking place here. With that in mind, I want to give you four things about the Savior. Even in the times when your boat is getting beaten to death, so to speak, when you feel like you can't take it anymore, where are you, God? When, you, when you're living in times like this, let me give you four things about Him. Number one, His presence. You say, what do you mean? Verse 38. This boat was full, right? This boat was flooding. This boat had a storm beaten up against it. This boat I'm talking about, friends, I mean this storm was huge. It was beating up against them. But the great thing about this ship, yes, it was being beaten. Yes, it was full and flooding. But understand, the Bible says he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep. By the way, the hinder part of the ship is the place of the pilot, you see. And even though the boat was full and beaten, and everywhere they looked they saw water, get it now, his presence was on board. He seemed unconcerned. He seemed unconcerned. But we'll find that when they come to him, he responds to their call. Even though they were questioning him and doubting him, let this help you. The ship with Christ on board may be beaten. It may be full. It may be flooding. But it will not and it cannot sink. Did you hear what I just said? Everybody has storms. Lost and saved. Everybody has storms. But what makes the difference is when you have the Savior on board your boat. Sometimes it may seem as if all hope is gone. Wow, I've been there. That is an awful place to be. And sometimes life gets so dark that it seems like what's the use? And all hope is gone. But with Him on board, I'm telling you, I, I'm li- look at me, look at me. You, listen, read the book and you get a little bit of an idea what I'm talking about. You can't, I can't explain to you where I was, Okay. You look at me, you see somebody that when Christ is on board, it will not sink. Amen. I can't tell you except somehow, some way, there came the time when Jesus Christ, God Himself, stepped in between me and the devil and said, that's far enough. I can't explain any other way. Number one, His presence. Is He on board your boat? If He is... Listen closely. It doesn't mean life is always going to be smooth. But you're going to make it to the other side just like he said. Because of his presence. His presence. Number two, we see his power. This is found in verse 39. Where the Bible teaches that he got up and he says, Peace be still. That phrase means be silent, be dumb, be muzzled, be gagged. That's what it means. Ordinarily, back in this day when these storms would come up, it would take a while for these waters and these things just to settle down. But in this, in this case, it was sudden peace. Let me tell you why. Because Psalm 89.9 says, Thou rulest the raging of the sea. When the waves thereof arise, thou stillest them. Psalm 93.4, The Lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters, yea, than the mighty waves of the sea. Here's what I'm saying. He can speak peace to a troubled sea. But here's what I've learned in my own life. Sometimes he doesn't speak peace to the sea. He'll speak peace to my heart. Even when the waters are raging, he can calm your heart. 
He has power to do that. Number one, His presence. If He's on board, you're going to be okay. Number two, His power. Number three, His problem. We see this in verse 40 where He asked them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? No faith in what? I'll tell you what no faith in. Him and His Word. See, because understand, they already had His Word early in this in this, in verse number 35, he said, Let us pass over unto the other side. Are you listening closely? When Jesus said, We're going to the other side, you're going to make it. Right. Amen, friends. Amen. He didn't say, Let me. He said, Let us. We are going to the other side. Amen. But when this storm came up in the middle of it, they started questioning, they started doubting, they had a problem. Here, He had a problem with their doubting and fearing the storm because he knew that they had his word. They, he said, let us pass over to the other side. Let me, let me help us all here. This happened to me. This, is, this, this, this happened to Habakkuk. This happened to John the Baptist. This happened to Moses. This happened to multitudes of people. Listen to me. When storms come, what we start to doubt is who God is. And what God has said. Here it is here. Carest thou not that we perish? They're doubting his character. Are you not who you say you are? Do you not care about us? They're doubting the character of God there. But then they're doubting the word of God. When they said we perish. That's doubting the word of God. You know, in the same way, when, 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 when the devil through the serpent came to Eve, what are the two things that he attacked? He attacked God's character and he attacked God's word. Because he said, yea, hath God really said this? He's trying to put a doubt on the word of God. Then he said, God knows that, that the day you eat of it, that you're going to become like him. In other words, God's withholding from you, Eve. You can't trust God. He's not telling you the whole truth. Can I say this to you? I have learned in my life that every storm that we go through, whether it's deep depression like me, whether it's cancer, whether it's some, it's a sudden tragic loss, whatever it is, the two things that are under attack, every time, mark it down, every time when you have a storm hits you, the, your mind is going to start attacking you and what it's going to start doubting is who God is and what God has said. And this is his problem here. He steals the storm. Then he looks at you and looks at them and he says, why are you so fearful? He, he even goes on to say here, it says, how is it that you have no faith? This, what a teaching tool here. Yes, this is a rebuke, but it's a loving rebuke. He's teaching them that no storm is bigger than the character of God. And no storm will negate the promises of God. It can't do that. But yet the devil will say, I thought he loves you. I thought God said he cares about you. Where is God? Wait a minute, God said He'll twist Scripture in your mind. He'll even use the truth to condemn. Are you listening to me? If the truth condemns a child of God, now I'm not talking about sin, that's another story. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about an unexpected storm. He'll use the truth and try to condemn you with it. Here's what I've learned. One of the names of the devil is he's the accuser of the brethren, right? He accuses the brethren. I've learned something as well. He also accuses God. See, he'll accuse you to God and Jesus Christ is there to intercede for us. Amen. But he'll start accusing God to the brethren. You can't trust him. Thought he said this. Said he'd never leave you or forsake you. Why do you feel forsaken? You know what I'm talking about, friends. This is the problem of the Savior here. He's teaching them... You are living by your, by your feelings and by your circumstances instead of trusting what I told you, we're going to make it to the other side. That's his problem. Then, in verse 41, we see his praise. 
You say, what's this? Look at, look at this now. And they feared exceedingly. Now, in verse number 40, they're fearing, right? What are they fearing? The storm. But when you go to 41, there's a change that takes place. And they feared exceedingly. And said one to another, what, how big of a storm this was. I can't believe it. Is that what they say? No, they say, what manner of man is this? And even the wind and the sea obey him. Here's the point, friends. This is really the point of the whole story. This was the point of my journey. That even when I was not believing God, I'm not saying everything I went through was of God. Doubt's not of God. Disbelieving God's not of God. Questioning the, the word of, that's not of God. No, no, no. That wasn't of God. But I, I listen, I, I, I have lived, Romans 8, 28. I have lived what the devil meant for evil, God meant it for good. I, I, I've, I've lived those two passages. That all things work together for good. And one thing I've learned in my own life, and we see it right here, is that the storm that once had their praise, so to speak, not that they were praising the storm, but they were, they were, they were giving their allegiance to the storm. You understand what I'm saying to you? This, this praise, this storm in the end, even though it made them afraid during it, when it's all said and done, that very storm is what gave Jesus Christ the glory He deserves. Get it, the fear once given to the storm was now given to Him. Somebody said, trouble is often the only fire which will burn away the dross that clings to our hearts. There was a ladies group that was studying the Bible and they came across the verse that, that calls God a, re, a refiner of silver. He sits as a refiner of silver. And they wondered, what, 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 is, what is the Lord trying to teach us when, they, when, he, when He calls Himself? He sits as a refiner of silver. And one of them said, well, I'm paraphrasing the story. He said, I know where there's a silver refining office or, 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 or business in, in this area. And, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to go watch this silver refiner do their work, and I'm going to ask some questions to see if he can shed some light on this verse. What's God teaching us that he sits as a refiner of silver? So they did. And they were watching this silver refiner do their work. And when the time came, they went to ask this silver refiner about, about their job, how they do their work. And that silver refiner said, well, I'm the one that puts the silver in the fire. And when the silver's in the fire, I never take my eyes off of it. I never take my eyes off of it because I'm looking for a precise moment when I know it's time to take it out. If I leave it in too long, it's not good. If I take it out too soon, it's not good. There's a precise moment when I know it's time to take it out. Well, the obvious question was, well, when's that time? And that silver refiner said this, when I'm looking at that silver in that hot flame, when I can see my own reflection in it, that's when I know it. It's time to take it out of the fire. Could God be teaching us that? When He says that He sits as a refiner of silver, sometimes He puts us in the fire. Amen or not, friends? But the whole time the devil will try to convince you He's not looking at you, He's asleep, He doesn't even care. Amen. By faith, you need to understand He never takes His eyes off of us. And he's looking to see a reflection of Jesus Christ. And when he does, he can take you out. What am I saying? I'm saying that this is a storm that in the end made them to believe more in him than they had before the storm. He knew about this storm beforehand. But they didn't. He knows what you're going through, even though maybe you didn't expect it. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Jesus said, Come unto me. All you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Let me ask you a question. When they came to him on board that ship, was it in faith? Did they go to him in faith? No. Oh. They went to him in fear. They went to him in doubt. Don't you even care? We're dying up here. Are you listening? 
But even though they came to him with the wrong spirit, so to speak, he still responded. Can I help you with something? You don't have to have great faith to fall at the feet of Jesus. You can come to Jesus with your doubts. You can come to Jesus with your fears. You can come to Jesus while you're questioning Him and saying, God, I don't get this. I don't, I, I don't even agree with this. God, what in the world are you doing? You say, really, I can talk to God that way? Yes, you can talk to God that way. Now, you can't stay that way in His presence long. But He's not afraid of your questions. He's not afraid of your doubts. Like I told you earlier in the week, and I probably told you last year, and I'm going to tell you again, just like that one time. You know, there's a lot of my own journey I forget. I thank God for that. I do. I thank the Lord for that. But there's a few things I remember, like telling my wife to take the blood pressure pills from me. There's a few things I remember, like that one night when I was outside, and I told you this earlier, and it was at night, I was by myself and looked up in, in, into the stars, the clouds, whatever it was that night. And I was angry and mad and upset and wondering why God's not pulling me out of this thing. And accusing Him. Mad at Him. Angry with Him. Are you listening? He would have been just if I'd have had a massive heart attack and went out to meet Him right there. But He didn't. You may tell you why? Because He knew that he was going to use what I was going through. And he knew that if I just didn't do something stupid, amen, friends, if I didn't do something stupid, he realized that I was just being, excuse me, an idiot. He doesn't understand, but he will. And now our story is helping people about everywhere we go. I'm not telling you do it like I did it. I'm telling you it's okay if you're as bad as I was. He wants to take your storm and settle it. I'm not saying that the waves will stop crashing. But He wants to use your storm to show you that there's someone greater than your storm on board with you. His name is Jesus. Let me ask you a question. What storm is beating up against your ship right now? What has you full and flooding? What is the big storm that's beating up against you to the point that now you're scared and you've even started questioning. Is it a personal sickness? Is it a financial trouble? A family sickness? A wayward child? A marriage problem? Depression like me? What is it? I'm telling you, call out to Him. Even if it seems like He's asleep. Because even when you're full and flooding and scared and skeptical, if you'll get a, give it a little bit of time, fall at His feet even though you're questioning, He too can arise and speak peace to your situation. Can I help you with a few things? John the Baptist is, a, is another example of this. John the Baptist stories really help me. I'm talking about this man is the forerunner of Jesus Christ, right? This is the man that Jesus himself said. There's not a greater that's ever been born than John the Baptist. But yet, when he's sitting in prison, and things aren't going well for him, he calls his disciples up to him and he tells them, Go ask him, are you really him? Can I remind you that this is after he has said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. John already knows the answer to his question. 
He already knows who Jesus is. But when he's sitting in his prison, he's questioning. Let me tell you when we question, not on the mountaintop. We question in the valley, don't we? And it's interesting, even in that passage, that when the disciples went to Jesus, hey, John wants to know, are you really him or or are we supposed to look for somebody else? Once again, there's no condemnation from Jesus. He simply started performing miracles. He pointed him to the Word of God. You say, what do you mean? He knew that John would recognize only Messiah could do these things. You go tell John that the lame are walking, the blind can see, the dead are raised again because he knew that John would recognize the Word of God. He pointed him right back to his Word. You see what I'm saying? And that carried John through. Take Moses who questioned God and God reminded him of who he is and what he's done and what he's going to do. Take Habakkuk who started questioning God in Habakkuk chapter 1 and God reminded him of who he is and he can trust the character of God even when life doesn't make sense. It's all the same. It's all the same. We need to stop believing the lies of the devil. Let me ask you a question. I'm just about done. I'm doing good. It's 746. I'm doing good, friends, okay? I got borrowed time here, all right? Listen closely. If you land in your mind, take it from somebody who's been there, okay? I wasn't there, I I was there for months, but thank God I'm not there. You see what I'm saying? I've been on that side of it though. Listen closely. This is the message. If you land in your mind that you cannot trust God, listen closely. If you land here, I cannot trust Him. He's not who He says He is. I can't believe what He says. Where do you go? Where do you go from there? Are you listening? If that's true, you can't trust God, you can't trust His Word, you can't believe what He says, He's not who He says He is. Are you listening? There is no hope. This is a big game. He's a monster. Playing a game with us. But you know what I've learned? I've learned through darkness, through an unexpected storm, through the storm that's beating the daylights out of me, I learned through it that He really is who He says He is. And you can trust Him. You can believe what He says. He's proven Himself to me. There's no other answer for me be to be preaching here in the state of Georgia. There's no other answer. There's no other answer for why I'm not six feet under the ground taking my life. There's no other answer except there's a God in heaven who is who He says He is. He does what He says He will do and you can take His promises to the bank. He always does what He says He will do. Stop believing that lie. Stop believing the lie that nobody cares and I'm all alone. And Jody don't even know what I've gone through. Sure, he went through darkness, but he doesn't know what I went through. That's what I thought. I told my wife, I said, nobody on planet earth has it as bad as me. Can you imagine that? Nobody. Because when you're going through it, you think yours is the worst thing that's ever happened and nobody understands and that's a lie of the devil. Other people do understand They've been there. No doubt if you're going through trials and tribulations, it's huge, it's big, it's beating. I mean, you're full, you're flooding, you're scared, you're skeptical. What do you do with it? Come to the feet of Jesus. And believe Him. Trust Him. Because you can trust Him whether you think you can or not. I'm not preaching that He will calm your storm. Because I don't know the mind of God. But I do know that God is who He says He is. Do you get it tonight, friends? This is a thought that will carry you all the way through until you see Jesus. I can trust God. It takes faith. I choose to believe God. 
Because if you don't, you are going to crumble in hopelessness. Amen? I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, help us tonight. Help us to see these truths. And not only see them, but to apply them to our hearts and lives. May you do business tonight with us.